recording. My name is Olivia Worrell. I have depression, anxiety, OCD, and an eating disorder. So when I was in fourth grade, I used to have a lot of issues with panicking and separation anxiety from my mom and my dad. You know, whenever they went out, I'd have like a freak out. I'd completely have a tantrum until they'd stay home with me and then I'd just like be kind of a mess the rest of the night. And I'd, you know, skip school sometimes. I'd often wake up on like Monday mornings, for example, in like fourth and fifth grade. Literally for every week, I'd just be like, I have a stomach ache, I can't go to school. And my mom would catch on to the fact that I just wanted to get out of school and sometimes I did have a stomach ache um, it was almost never from an actual stomach bug it was just anxiety getting to me the first time I knew I had anxiety was in fourth grade and although I didn't know what it was called I definitely knew that's how it felt and I was taken to a therapist and I just didn't have a great experience and I didn't want to talk about it and I felt crazy and because of that I kind of hid my feelings away and in seventh grade my anxiety kind of crept in again with depression I think that's the first time I really knew what depression was besides just kind of hearing about it and seeing it in movies so that was really hard for me I was in a really dark place in seventh grade and I began to resort to self-harm and isolating myself it was tough and I wasn't really telling people until it got really bad and my friends were like you need to talk to somebody and that's when I kind of talked to my parents but I still refused to go to therapy because I just had that really bad experience when I was in fourth grade so then eighth grade came around and I've always been tall all of my friends were shorter than me which means that they weighed a lot less than me. Although I knew if you are taller, you weigh more, I wasn't fully understanding that I would always be somebody who weighs more than somebody who's five inches shorter than me. And so I became really insecure about my weight and my height, and I just kind of started seeing exercise as a way to lose weight. And so I started looking at calories, and I started limiting myself, but not to a very extreme extent at the time because I was still 15, 14, for better of course I did not have the willpower for that so ninth grade came around and my eating had been a little bit better it was kind of just like a phase almost but that was my first brush with my eating disorder so in ninth grade I was a freshman at Moses Brown um, it was my first year I like to say that I gained the freshman 15 but in high school because I was not used to the meal plan we have here where you can just eat whatever you want whenever you want so I definitely put on weight it wasn't like necessarily a noticeable amount of weight but I noticed it just because I was very conscious of my body every freshman girl I saw was you know tiny it just made me insecure and I so I gained that weight and sophomore year I was like I don't want to be like this and I'd been insecure since freshman year I hadn't done anything about it because I was like no that's stupid or like it won't work for me I'm not strong enough to be able to do that so sophomore year I actually ended up getting into a relationship in March 2017 it was really a bad relationship. I had been feeling really insecure about myself since spring break. I kind of saw myself in a bathing suit and I was like, I don't like that. And so my anxiety was, you know, trickling into that, of course, and my OCD definitely led to my eating disorder. I kind of found my control in calories. Another thing I've had a hard time with that kind of goes hand in hand with anorexia and bulimia is body dysmorphia. I think that's kind of something that's assumed when people have an eating disorder, but it's not always a story. Body dysmorphia is, it's kind kind of how it sounds. You just don't see your body the way that it is. And it can be honestly a giant mind fuck. Like, I don't know how to explain it. There have been times, and it all depends on my mental state for me personally and where I'm at in my eating disorder, but my eating disorder also feeds off of that. So it's like a, it's this vicious cycle. I, I like, I literally look in the mirror sometimes and I feel like I'm looking at somebody completely different. Like it makes me so upset when I like pass by the mirror in the gym and all I see oh gosh I just wish I didn't hate myself so much and it's really it's terrifying but it's real and it affects a lot of people and it feels like there's something constantly on your shoulder just kind of talking to you in your ear. You can't get rid of it. It's like it's just part of you. I mean, it's it's not a good feeling, but I think it's something that a lot of people struggle with and don't talk about as much as I wish we did. So jumping back into sophomore year, I rediscovered that I could lose weight by restricting myself. I was in a very toxic relationship which fed into a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression and I had been on meds at that point. I was diagnosed officially my freshman year with depression and anxiety and I was put on meds immediately. I had a therapist, didn't love her, didn't hate her, she was okay. I ended up finding a new one who I loved but I was having a really hard time and I didn't really know how to voice that because I didn't want 
to tell anybody about how much I was struggling in my relationship because I didn't want them to dislike the boy that I was dating. And so because of that kind of toxic energy and the anxiety, generally what happens is when I'm in a time where I'm stressed or anxious, I tend to take that out on myself. When I feel like I don't have control of a lot of things, I control my food. Basically by junior year, I had lost 20 pounds in two months. People were noticing because I was struggling with anorexia and some bulimic tendencies, I took that as a compliment when people would say I looked skinny or sickly or oh my gosh you lost weight in my head I was just like it's working people are noticing I'm, I'm getting skinny I gotta keep doing this and I just kind of fed into it and by the time I had ended things with that relationship I had been so deep into that that it felt like I couldn't escape it it kind of became this addiction to the feeling of being hungry or having that control and I eventually started seeing somebody who specialized in eating disorders my eating disorder had kind of taken over my life at that point. My weight had dropped to the point where if I had lost even another pound, my doctors feared that it would jump below the kind of ideal weight for somebody my height and it would fall into the underweight category and they were worried about that because my body was, it wasn't like working the way it usually does. I stopped getting periods for a little bit. I was cold constantly. I was dizzy. If I stood up for too long, I'd feel like I was gonna pass out. Eventually what happened was my doctors basically told me that I had to see a therapist once a week, a eating disorder therapist once a week. I had to go to the hospital once a week for weigh-ins and check-ins. I had to go to my pediatrician often and I had to go to a support group every week. The support group helped a lot. I still keep in contact with the people who are in that support group. Oh and I had to go to a nutritionist. I was just consumed by like the eating disorder and even if it was about recovery all I could think about was my eating disorder. It made it really hard to distance myself from it. I was put on like a little bit of a meal plan, didn't really follow through with it. I wasn't allowed to exercise. Eventually it got to the point the end of last year where I had to have lunch with my mom every day because they didn't believe that I was eating. It was probably a good thing because if I wasn't supervised I'd eat nothing and throughout the day I'd probably eat 500 to 900 calories depending on how I was feeling and if I ate more than that I'd punish myself either by throwing up or fasting the next day or using laxatives it was not a fun time it's an ongoing thing so I, I still struggle with that today I still look at food and the first thing I think of is how many calories is in it I've memorized a lot of that <laughs> it's it sucks but it's becoming more of a subconscious thing than something that I'm consciously looking at and calculating and holding myself to my eating disorder will always be there it's just just about pushing it as far as I can to the back of my mind until it's, it's there but it's not something that I'm consciously paying attention to and feeding into too because that's where it becomes really dangerous. There are plenty of times where I have kind of relapsed during recovery where I've fallen back into old habits. Sometimes I know when I'm going to and I have a hard time stopping myself and other times it kind of catches me by surprise and then I'm just in really deep. I don't think I'd be able to get nearly as close to how far I've come which isn't super far but it's somewhere um, without my friends and my family and my dog. I love my mm -hmm. dog. I couldn't have done it without Jess Stewart and Kate Turner and just all of the support that I've been shown. Aside from that, I've had a lot of trouble finding support in our school. I think that's kind of why I wanted to do this project because it's really important to me and I know how hard it is. If I didn't have those people by my side constantly supporting me, I wouldn't have been able to get to the point where I was the one who wanted to recover because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many people are telling you to recover. You have to want it to do it and and that often comes from support from other people. I just want that support at our school for people who are struggling. Taking those small steps to asking people how they are when they look upset and letting people know that you're there for them and appreciating people. I just think talking about it, of course, and just every, every day, every interaction that you have, not shying away from talking about it and sharing your story and even if it's not in depth you just gotta be real and be honest what i'm doing to try to end the stigma i know i can't end it on my own and 
as a school we probably can't end it worldwide. I know that I'm putting all of my heart into this and I know that if I even help one person understand mental illness more clearly or help one person realize that they're not alone, that's that's all I want. I just want one person, whether it's understanding someone else or understanding themselves, I want somebody to feel confident on the topic of mental illness and I want anybody watching this to know that in your community, no matter how shushed away mental illness is, it's there and you're not alone if you feel that way. There's always gonna be someone who has your back and sometimes it's the people who you least expect and that's kind of the beauty in it is there are people around you that you'd never expect to understand and they do. So this may be small, but I'm hoping that this project helps somebody. I have depression. Anxiety and depression. Major depressive disorder, anxiety, OCD, and eating disorder. I didn't. Generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, and major depressive disorder. Yes, I do. Yes. Yes. To some degree. I have anxiety and dysthymia, which is the kind of depression where it's like long lasting but it comes in spurts. I do. Yes. 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 I'd say it's blinding. I feel like it blinds you from kind of everything else you have in life. If it's anxiety, you feel like the only thing that's in front of you is whatever's making you anxious. If it's depression, it's whatever's in front of you. That's all you can see and it's all you can focus on and that's all you want to do is kind of ruminate in those depressive thoughts. With an eating disorder especially, it's completely, like it completely takes you by surprise in random moments and it completely blinds you from what your body actually needs to function and how others view you and how you should view yourself. And OCD kind of goes with that too. You can't see anything else until you get something done or you turn the doorknob a certain way. It kind of depends on the day. There are some days where I just feel heavy. It's kind of like a weight is just tied to my entire mental function. Loneliness is a big part of it, at least for me. I act a lot. I don't show like my true self. It makes everything more complicated. It strains a lot of my friendships. So a lot of friendships that I have here won't last forever. I've been diagnosed with depression and ADHD and anxiety. Normally during the summer around spring like it is now, it's a lot better, but during the winter and the fall I just feel like shit. It makes me hate myself, it makes me feel like there's no real point. And then I get out of it around this time, it still sort of lingers throughout the year. Like a constant burden. I have anxiety and depression and it makes me feel confused scared and alone it's really hard there's a lot of really high highs and a lot of really low lows i have to approach every day differently really difficult at times sometimes i don't always feel like it's there there are other moments when it's really overwhelming well i have depression anxiety ocd and some other sensory stuff i was diagnosed with depression when i was seven so it's always been like a label they put on me it feels lonely difficult it's also empowering it's something that i know is personal to me and makes me unique and makes me stronger at the end of the day. At the beginning, it was really scary. I'd just like be doing something normal and then all of a sudden everything feels like it's crashing down on me and like the walls feel like they're closing in. But like now, like I know when I'm having an episode, so I isolate myself and just let like the feelings like wash over me until I'm okay enough to like rejoin society again. I don't have a real diagnosis. All I know is that because of past events, there's been a change in the way I think and the way that I go about my life. Yeah, I feel really anxious. It's really hard to say like how I feel. Talking to someone really helps. It feels some days like I don't even think about it. Other days it feels like it's another layer of who I am. It feels like sometimes it's a it's something that's an interface between me and other people. So it's a visceral thing that impacts how I interact with people. The analogy has been that I'm sort of on a life raft and I'm paddling just to stay afloat rather than being able to just sort of float along and manage my life. So sometimes it feels like I'm really paddling hard and sometimes it feels like I'm not even thinking about it. It feels like very helpless. Most of the time I feel like I'm alone in this because it's something that you don't openly talk about with other people. It's pretty hard to even tell your friends that, hey, I'm suffering from eating disorder because I don't really show anything. This like positive, happy person. Nobody will really think, oh, Scott has an eating disorder. So it's really hard to tell them without being like considered melodramatic, I guess. A lot of people wouldn't believe me that I have an eating disorder and they were just like, you're probably just making a huge deal out of it. I wish people were more educated, be more considerate. <laughs>
So I have anxiety and it kind of came on mid thirties when more kind of stressors are entering your life and it doesn't feel good. It feels, um, at times you can feel out of control. It's just I, like I get queasy with anxiety. A lot of people don't really understand it, so I kind of treat it like it's a physical illness because to me it kind of is. Like having watched it, having relatives that suffer from mental illness, it's hard to watch people not understand it. But I, I usually just tell them that I'm there for them, remind them how good of a friend they are to me. I'm there for them if they need it. And I just like to tell them that they're loved and remind them that there are people that really care about them. But sometimes it's really hard because you don't know how you can help. You just have to understand that it's an ongoing thing and that they're working on it and they're doing everything they can and so you have to meet them halfway. I feel like it's a very invisible disease. You don't really know what's going on with the person. I've never really like talked to anyone about mental health so I also don't know how to deal with it from the outside. You know when you're drawing and you start scribbling, that's just like what their mind is. I know people who suffer from depression can be like the happiest people but they just don't say anything. I see a lot of stress and panic when it comes to schoolwork, like just being really overwhelmed, irritability, tiredness, isolation. It looks like a lot of different things. It looks different for each person. Some people you can barely even tell. My brother, we'll call him Michael, has ADD, addiction, and depression, and he has struggled a lot with substance abuse over the last year. We've had many hospital visits and many instances where I've been there for kind of some of his episodes, I guess. That's caused like a sort of anxiety in me. I haven't been calm, I guess, in a really long time, but it's, it's really tough being the person that kind of like watches it happen. There's like the real world that's happening and they live in their own environment that, that nobody can get into and then when you try to go and get them back to the actual real world it's like they don't they can't find the path I wasn't diagnosed until last winter, winter of my junior year, but I would say I started suffering for the majority of my sophomore year, but I just didn't know enough about it to realize what it was and look for help. It was just like an event that happened at the end of uh, freshman year, so I had kind of just been bottling up emotions. I thought that I would get better in high school just because there would be more people, but it really didn't. Someone yelled at me and that just made me like snap. I just had a panic attack for like two, three hours. And I had to to the emergency room. I got diagnosed with depression by my therapist in early 2016. I remember a specific day when I sort of realized that I'm not as good as I think I am. It was uh, right after I came to Moses Brown and I had insulted someone because that's what people do in New Zealand. I called someone a uh, twat, which is just like a thing you say in New Zealand, but here it's uh, not. I got in trouble. My mother got very angry with me and I remember just thinking, wow, I really fucked up. I just started thinking, you know, is this how I've always been? Is this a problem. When I was younger, I knew something was a little off because I was always anxious, but I officially knew last summer, which was 2018, like mid-July. I had this awful panic attack outside in my backyard actually, and everything just kind of started like drifting out of place and I felt like I was kind of zoning out into like a different dimension and it just really freaked me out and I went to see a therapist then I got diagnosed. Sixth or seventh grade, it was just a really rough year for me and I could tell that I was more sad and more scared than usual. Sixth grade, I struggled with a lot of body image issues and I didn't really address them. I just thought it was something that was just wrong with me. So I don't think I've reached out and talked to anyone about it until like seventh grade. For as long as I can remember, I've been anxious. It was something that was diagnosed when I was like a younger teenager, but before that, I can remember being more anxious and concerned about pretty much everything. They told me when I was seven. I didn't really think of anything until I was 12 with the depression stuff. The anxiety and the OCD, it's like when I was four, I couldn't wear certain socks. With numbers, odd numbers are really bad. Ever since I was like three, I never knew why until like they told me. So in middle school, I've had a couple of friends like ghost me, like leave me without saying anything. I've also just always been stressed about school. A lot of it is the pressure that I put on myself, but also just the Moses Brown environment of academics. I also I also had two injuries last year, so being on crutches from the beginning of the school year to the end, and I was on crutches the whole summer, so it's just not really motivational to not be able to carry something for yourself. Sophomore year, winter time, I was just having a lot of difficulty sleeping, difficulty with my mood, being really rude to my parents and sometimes my friends, feeling really disassociated from everyone around me, feeling just so alone even though I knew I had so many people supporting me. I had a conversation 
YouTube of my parents around Thanksgiving time, sophomore year, just saying, I'm not okay. I don't really know what's going on. I feel really lost and like I have nobody to talk to. Can we do something about it? Then, you know, we got doctors involved and I went on antidepressants. That's when it became real and I became, you know, diagnosed with depression. Seventh grade in the summer, it was in a really dark place and I turned to things that weren't safe or good and I felt I was very alone and I had just like had like an altercation kind of with my friends so I felt very alone and I didn't really know how to name it because I felt like if I labeled myself as having a mental illness and I'd become kind of like a burden to like my parents because my sister had gone through something similar. Like fourth grade when I knew when my parents knew I was like three. Before I really don't have any experience with mental illness after that that time I feel something that I never felt before and I realized maybe something's going on and I talked to my mother and she helped me to find someone to talk with. I didn't even think about mental health at all until I was 19 and my dad killed himself. And so managing that experience and sort of working in therapy through that over the years helped. In the course of the therapy and after that's when I was in my 20s, it became clear to me that I had some of my own issues with depression. And I don't know that they were there before that. I also think that once I got out of college, I think it became more of an issue, certainly once I was in a relationship and I was getting married and I was having kids. So I think it really became climactically problematic when I started having kids. The stressor of that just sort of you know inflamed whatever else was already naturally there that's when i really started getting treatment for that rather than sort of treatment for like how do you feel about the fact that your dad killed himself and so that was really when i was talking more about me and my own relationships and how i interact with other people and how i needed to sort of rethink how i interface with people in a way that helps me to stand up for myself at first I thought bulimia and the rules are something that I can control. Like say, I can just stop whenever I want to. And then when I realized I was struggling, I think was, I don't know, half a year ago, I realized that I couldn't stop anymore. It's no longer just something that if I eat too much, I'll just get rid of the food. It later became something that I can't even endure anything in my stomach at all. So whenever I eat anything, I throw them all up. That's like when I realized, oh my God, this is not okay. And then I started passing out in the showers. That's like when I knew I might need to seek help and I could to stop even if I wanted to. Super laid back kid. I grew up like anything would go. Mm -hmm. Nothing really bothered me. My parents were actually bothered that nothing bothered me. And then as I got older and I went to college and I started to kind of get this this like feeling and I didn't know what this rushed feeling was. And then junior and senior year I started to kind of pay more attention. Come to find out I guess I was anxious. When I was a child, my parents kind of taught me what mental illness was, what taught me what physical illness was. Because we had a history of that in our family, they wanted me to know that it was okay if I was ever not feeling like myself or if I ever started to have symptoms of either bipolar or depression. They wanted me to know that that was a real thing and that it was okay to feel that way and that I could receive help from it and then get better. People who have mental illness, how it affects the rest of their body, it's not just a mental thing. One thing just affects another. And how it's really a large problem that we have that people don't understand that and don't take it seriously when someone is hurting that much. At first, they didn't think anything was wrong. It wasn't until they read my diary they saw what I was saying about myself. No one should have to like go through that. I was playing soccer this fall. I was on varsity, but as the season went on, it was very negative and there was nothing nice to say about me. As a sophomore, you don't really get played that often. I remember playing with JV and I purposely didn't play the both halves because there's a rule where you can only play three halves in one day. The coach would get upset because I played two halves JV and I could only play one half. I played one half JV and, you know, the coach said, oh, you know, Paloma's fine. I would recommend her to play. She's all warmed up. I didn't play until the end of the first half. I was so cold because, you know, we were outside. I was stiff. I pretty much just got, like, beat up on the field. Like, I got bulldozed multiple times. Substitution came and I actually originally wasn't going to get subbed out, but I guess someone made a mistake, so there were too many people on the field. And so the coach just said, oh, Paloma to come out. As I was running back to the sideline, everyone was just yelling at me. Negative things. Like, everyone that's on my team. So, I remember I got off that field and I passed out due to, like, anxiety. And I stopped soccer. That fall was my last season. And then, during the winter, I did art. 
someone needed a prop manager. I have been a prop manager ever since for all the productions after. The first time that I had an issue with body image was when I was seven. And when I was sitting in a chair, I sat on my toes so mm -hmm. that way my thighs would look smaller. And my mom was like, are you sitting like that? That's mm -hmm. super weird. We had a conversation about that, but it's not like a conversation when you're that young. Yeah. It's really gonna have an effect for the future. Mm -hmm. My aunt, for sure, definitely struggled with an eating disorder. My sister, I always looked up to her and I always felt like she was so perfect and I always really wanted to look like her and we just have very different body types. When I couldn't fit into her clothes, that was always just really difficult. Once I realized that I could control how my body looked, I really jumped on that bandwagon. I think anxiety was a bigger issue for me in high school than depression. And I remember the first time that my parents put me on medication. I didn't go to a therapist to have any of that diagnosed. My doctor was a family friend. I had panic attacks. My family has had some deaths because of mental illness and also just addiction. And so I was terrified that because I needed to take antidepressants or any anxiety medication that that meant that I was like them and I was gonna end up like them and so that was really scary for me I took them but I kind of ignored what they were for I thought about them as like a breathing medication I would go on and off of them which is also not great because when you go off of them that like drop is really really overwhelming I always kind of paid attention to what I eat but then in college I joined the crew team and then I started coxing and I am pretty tall to be a cox I felt like I needed to overcompensate for the fact that I was tall we would have weigh-ins frequently the number definitely felt like a defining feature for who I was I kind of just stopped eating and I remember I would go to the vending machine and I would get the lemon lime Gatorade or whatever and I would split it up into multiple bottles put water in it and then that's what I would eat for dinner eventually I passed out in my dorm room because I hadn't eaten enough I think I was brought to the hospital or in urgent care but someone who I didn't know found me I would say that was a wake-up call for my parents like I was having conversations with them after that and they were saying, you know, we really think you have an issue. So I started going to group in an outpatient program. It was helpful in some ways to feel like I wasn't the only person, but it also, other people seemed worse than I was. And so I was like, oh, it's not a big deal. I had some really hard times with some of the people on the team, some of the things that they would say, they would joke about getting me a tapeworm to help out. They made this horrible joke about a cheese grater and like grating off fat on me. It was awful. I also over, worked out and I remember my husband told me at some point after we were married he brought up that he had seen me on campus and that I just looked so pale and I looked so skinny and I looked so sick and he didn't know me at the time but he was like I noticed that you were like obviously not okay and at the time I really hated my body I hated myself I remember I had a falling out with some of the people on the team that was the summer after my junior year that I met Jake my husband we had another two really really close friends the four of us and it was first time that I felt like I was being valued not because of how I looked not because of what I could do for them but I actually felt just like cared about they really paid attention to what I was eating in a way that wasn't judgmental I didn't see a therapist like consistently until I was working here and I remember when I started dating Jake he would ask me every night have you eaten something just one thing one cucumber like it does not matter but literally one thing that was also the year I decided I wasn't gonna weigh myself anymore so I haven't seen my weight in eight years just gonna keep going it made it a lot easier to feel like the number wasn't as big of a deal I started rowing on the men's crew team they were so much more welcoming and kind and they didn't give a crap about what I weighed Jake was just so supportive and so all of those things made me feel like I was fine then I started working and I started feeling extremely anxious really really depressed i would teach some classes handle whatever i had to handle and then i would like go into the prep room and just like have a panic attack got myself together i'm pretty good at putting a face on and then i started dealing with some things that were external for myself i decided that i needed to see a therapist for those things and i adore my therapist he is wonderful and he is really really good at calling me out on my shit 
which I really appreciate. And he talked a lot about how my anxiety and depression are clearly getting in the way of how I live my life. The more open I am about my mental health, the more helpful it is for other students who find themselves in that situation. So I try really hard to be as open as I can, but that doesn't mean that I don't have hiccups along the way. I'm planning on going to see another therapist again for eating issues because that's been an issue recently for me. And it's not something that's gonna go away. It just makes me a stronger, more empathetic, kinder person having dealt with all of this. And it's gonna get better and then it might get worse. But being aware of it is like the first step. And that's hard for me to hear and that's hard for me to tell other students because it feels like a really negative outlook, but it's realistic. It's honest. I mean, I still have my moments, but I'm really proud of the progress that I've made. It's just step by step having a person who can check in with you without being judgmental and without assuming that you're trying to do this intentionally, assuming that you are looking for attention, assuming that you were strong enough to not do this before, so why can't you just not do it now? Having a person who doesn't feel that way is so, so valuable. And it's difficult to find, but once you do, you gotta hold on tight. For my family, it's just sort of like, okay, this person's dealing with something, we're not gonna talk about it. I don't have very much experience with it. I've never talked to my mom about it at all, like within myself or like with her. You know, we'll talk about things that are happening, but it's never come down to like, okay, what's going on? I've talked to a therapist like once. It was a very awkward experience and I never went back. So I wanna know more about it, but I just don't know how to talk about it. And our society it's become so like normalized if that makes sense on social media and stuff like that like oh I'm feeling depressed today and it's like obviously people use humor to like get through pain but people actually do deal with these things I went to a camp August 2017 I was there for two weeks and after a week I stared into traffic and I very seriously considered walking out into traffic and I was like you know what nah I won't and then I just sort of broke down like that day I don't remember why and I mentioned that and I had to go home for the weekend and everyone sort of freaked out and thought that I really was going to kill myself when really it was sort of just a, a glimpse into the abyss. So whenever I mention anything about death, I just like, you know, do you feel like you did back then? And it wasn't, maybe it was serious. Maybe I'm just deluding myself because everyone else seems to think it was serious. Something that I've struggled with is making comparisons to other people. I haven't necessarily been diagnosed with any sort of body dysmorphic disorder specifically. I think that I probably would be if I talked to a doctor. I definitely do a lot of comparing other girls' legs to my own legs. I hate it because I would really like to be able to look at my own legs in the mirror and be like, they look good. But it is like the worst feeling in the world when you like go to try on your jean shorts from last summer and you're like, they don't fit anymore. I hate this whole thing in general because societally females are pressured to look a certain way and I, I hate that I'm succumbing to that. I don't, but I can't necessarily control the thoughts that just kind of pop in my head. And I wish that as a culture, we were more accepting of people who just didn't look exactly like the beauty type that we, you know, push girls to emulate. There was a time when I felt like I couldn't do it anymore and I felt really like suicidal. I let Tyler know, my boyfriend, that I was feeling that way and my friend Natalie and they both ended up driving over to my house to like come talk to me. It was like such like a powerful feeling to know that I had like my boyfriend and my friend together like here so like holding both my hands like through the entire time like helping me out, feeding me these like positive affirmations that I could like go on. I actually ended up in Hasbro Children's Hospital as an inpatient for 11 days. That also helped with the, the feeling of not being alone just because I was surrounded by all of these other kids who like struggled with similar things as me. Young kids who understood each other to a level where a lot of kids that you'd see at school wouldn't understand. Honestly, it impacted my life. It impacts me today. I want to do more for the people there. The staff was incredible. I can't even put into words how much they meant to me while I was there. I wrote 18 cards on the last day I was there to each and every person who helped me individually with something so little, but I still felt like I owed that to them. Coming out of there, I just felt like a new person who had like pushed through like the bad time and just get to a more manageable, like stable state of being. Since then, I felt so much more like comfortable dealing with the panic attacks and feelings of worthlessness and all like the racing thoughts and stuff. Like if you're not in a stable place, I believe that anything helps. Like really, it's okay to not be okay. So in sixth grade, I suffered a lot with body image issues and being the ideal, like beautiful girl, I guess. There was a couple kids that would just pick on me a lot of the time and that's when my anxiety really started picking up. I've been a really anxious kid ever since I remember. Like I'd get hiccups because I was so anxious and I get them like weekly. In seventh grade, the summer was really tough because we split into teams. So like my friend group was basically split in half. I loved my friends on my team, but 
just not having our whole friend group together kind of made the experience harder. I just fell into this place where I was super alone and then seventh grade was just feeling loved but then feeling not loved. Like always trying to have someone tell me that I am loved even though it didn't even help if they were doing that. Eighth grade was a better year. I started seeing therapists and like figuring out ways to cope. Freshman year came around and the anxiety levels just went through the roof. Depression got bad, but it was a lot different than other times because this time it wasn't like, I feel like neutral all the time. It was like, I'm great. Like, I think I'm getting over this. And then weeks where it was just terrible. The worst thing about it is that it's not a choice. It's not like I wake up in the morning and I'm like, today we're going to be anxious for no freaking reason. But it's just something that happens because that's the way my brain is wired. Given the choice, I would obviously opt not to have anxiety because it's so debilitating at times. And when people tell you things along the lines of like, relax. If I could, I very much would. My identity as a, as a student and just a person in general is that I really care about everything, but I, I really care about how I'm perceived. And so I throw myself into everything I do probably 110%. And so I was really, really trying and really, really failing. It made me question, well, who am I if I'm not a student? And who am I if I'm not getting A's? It sort of just overwhelms that and it's not a choice. It's just like what happens in my brain. And so I have to work really hard to actively be like, no, you're fine. <laughs> like you are not an issue if you fail at something. I've seen a therapist since I was like five. I used to hate therapy. Last year I got a new therapist. I literally love her. I've been taking meds since I was like nine. I'd say until last year it was mostly like I had depression but it was like pretty controlled last year freshman year I knew I wasn't like really ready for high school so I went to high school a lot of tests a lot of things so I got really stressed out last year I guess it was really like the time of my like worst downfall I was hospitalized for two and a half weeks then like I got out for like a week <laughs> then I went back for like two months and then I had to go to like partial after that so I guess with that part was the hardest because as again that's why I had a repeat freshman year a bunch of my friends have mental illness I don't really talk to them about it, I guess just because I try to keep their spirits up more if they want to talk about it Like I'm totally there, but usually I just try to keep their mood up I am typically a very confident person I'm not afraid to be myself never apologizing for who I am But high school and definitely parts of middle school have made me feel really insecure about myself Definitely with academics too. Moses Brown is a really hard school and I've had a lot of challenges here with schoolwork and not always feeling very supportive by my teachers. I was trying my hardest and then there was a point where I just couldn't try anymore and I felt like I couldn't do anything. When lacrosse season was going on and I'd come home from lacrosse practice exhausted, I'd just be there alone with myself. Negative thoughts would come flooding in. Just felt like there was no way that I belonged here. I just felt so physically and mentally fatigued and drained that I felt like there's nothing I had to offer to this world. And so I I knew that it was really bad when I wanted to hurt myself and I've never known myself to be a person who would ever harm myself in any physical way but you know I surprised myself I cut myself for a period of time I had gotten to a point where I didn't know how to talk about what was going on and I didn't know that it was okay not to be okay and so I turned to permanent marks on my body so that hopefully somebody would see and ask, you know, are you okay? And so it was just this weird thing because when I would do it, I would feel better for some reason. It didn't make sense and it confused me even more. And then I also hated myself even more because I was so shocked and surprised with my behavior and the fact that I would ever even do that. I had seen my friends go through self-harm and mental illness and had always felt like I could support them because even though I never had the same struggles that they did, I just could always empathize and see the good in my friends. It's hard to go home and not tell myself that same advice. I've talked to my therapist about it. I've talked to some friends about it. My parents don't know, but maybe they will be finding out in this video and I'm sorry that I didn't tell you, but I'm not ashamed of it. And that's honestly my strong message here. I don't ever condone self-harm, but if it is something that you have experienced or gone through, there's no shame to it. 
because you were in a place where you thought it was okay and it was going to make things better. I am so grateful for the struggles I went through. Those times where I felt alone, crying myself to sleep, hurting myself, that has made me so, so much stronger and has also allowed me to use my experiences to help others. One thing that has helped me immensely with my mental health issues is a therapist. I get really scared of being judged and being humiliated. Really deep rooted emotions that I need to be able to like literally release from my body. Once my parents got me a therapist, everything changed. But just being able to talk about everything that was on my mind or everything that I pushed down, I just can't express how important that was for me and how I think important that is for everybody. Everybody has stuff going on and whether you have a good friend you can unload it to or a family member or anyone, I still think it's really important to know that there are professionals out there who will listen. I think that's one of the biggest things that's really helped me and guided me through this process of, you know, loving myself. And another thing is, you know, support from my friends and family. I don't know where I would be without, you know, these people who have completely changed my life. My family is so supportive, which I'm so grateful for. Same with my friends. At the end of the day, nobody cares about you, like, wasting their time or whatever. If they care about you, they will understand that you're going through something and do everything they can to help you. But they can't do anything if you don't speak out and be honest about it. Just today I saw like two people crying because of a heart assessment or just being really overwhelmed and things like that. So that's where I'm seeing a lot of my friends affected by mental illness. I've had panic attacks over like really trivial things. I would say I don't usually tell people or people would be like, oh, like I'd never guess because I don't like to kind of let people into that side of me, especially with depression. It just kind of feels like, like I don't know what's wrong, but everything is wrong at the same time. And my brain's just like self imploding. Like I can't move over that summer. Like I turned to self harm and like I didn't know how to tell anyone. I didn't. My sister kind of just found them one day and it was really difficult. I wanted to discuss self-harm. I think it's a topic that beyond just the taboo around mental illness, I think even in that community it's taboo and it should be talked about more. It's been about a year now since the last time I did it, but what I, I think people who don't have personal experience fail to understand is that it in and of itself is a form of addiction and tends to be a vicious spiral. I still think about doing it almost every day and have the urge to at least once a week. It's really difficult for people who haven't been there to understand the, the reasoning behind it. And there's a multitude of reasons. Some are way too complex to get into. But I think the important thing to take away if you're a person who is just trying to understand is that what tends to happen is cutting in and of itself releases and the endorphins in your brain, the same ones that would be released from working out. So it gives you that same feeling. You know, you do it and then you feel bad. You beat yourself up overdoing it and then that drives you further down into the pits. You end up doing it again until something or someone pulls you out of that cycle. It is by far one of the most toxic coping skills you can try to use. I have anxiety and depression. I was diagnosed in depression year. My parents always knew I had anxiety because when I was really little, whenever I was nervous about something, I would hold my breath until I turned blue. And then I would like almost pass out every single time. <laughs> And I wouldn't go to other people's houses. They would come to my house. Even at like family things, I would cry every single time if it wasn't at my house with my mom or something. If I was like left alone, even with like my grandma or something. In starting middle school, I just got like really depressed. I would cry like every single night about nothing. And I would sleep like 14 hours a day. So I've had a lot of friends with mental illnesses. In my experience, most of those friends are part of the LGBTQ plus community, which is like a big thing because it puts them at a higher stake for mental illnesses. So I've seen some people struggle with finding their identity, who they are, and that causing a lot of stress and confusion and anxiety in them. And that can lead to some depression or just increased anxiety overall. Sometimes it feels like others can understand you. It's really not good because you want some someone to be here and understand what you feel. It's really hard to talk about it. My dad had killed himself. Separating his action from me was really hard. So, so, mm -hmm. so that was my first real grappling with the idea that mental illness is about that person's 
brain and that person's experience and it obviously impacts the, the people around them but when you're a kid you think it's all about you and you think it's all because of you or something to do with you and so as I started sort of recognizing my own issues with mental illness I've had to actively work to make sure that I don't fall back into old patterns mm -hmm. so for me mental illness is a it's habits of mind that are instinctive to me <clears throat> that make me less successful in my day less successful in relationships either when there's a real major stressor in my life and so I just don't have the capacity to be at my best or when I haven't been really actively thinking about myself and supporting myself in terms of mental wellness then it comes back again so that I think is a piece of my experience having children has been complicated because there's definitely a hormonal piece that comes mm -hmm. with having children and there's a I definitely had postpartum depression um, after my second child I was really depressed at that point and that's when I started taking medication and that was really helpful because I think the way I, the way I describe that is that the medication would put air in my life raft and I was really anxious and worried about the idea of medication because I was I was thinking it would somehow change my way I think about things and it was a real relief to realize that I still am who I am and I think the same way I, again I just feel like I have air in the life raft so I can be who I want to be my daughter when she was in her senior year she really struggled with mental illness and so it manifested in her as being being angry and cranky with her sibling and she was doing really well in school and she was doing really well in terms of being the captain of the soccer team and having friends and so we didn't see it as being mental wellness we saw it as being like a cranky hormonal teenager it spiraled and she was doing self-harm and she was having suicidal thoughts and then she ended up being hospitalized she never tried to commit suicide but she was planning it you're watching someone else that you want to care for going through it and struggling with it and and knowing that there's deep down there's very little you can actually do and mm -hmm. so much of it is about them it sounds weird to say it was helpful to watch her in her moments where she was really struggling with her depressive feelings and articulating what she was thinking and feeling and realizing that in those moments there was no accessing her because it made me realize it was that was the parallel to my dad. It's like I realize now that there's really it was about him and it wasn't about me. So about a year ago, we were in my car and he just whipped out a jewel and I didn't really think anything of it because like all my friends do it. But then we started getting to like worse drugs after that and then it was vodka and weed at the same time in the basement alone and that's when like kind of red flags started like kind of going off. My uncle as well also has early onset dementia. He he had previous drug use like cocaine heroin in his teens and that bit him in the butt later in life. Addiction has run in my family so I have to be really careful with what I do. I have to think about things that like other people don't really have to think about. You don't really understand it for many of the people that I know that have disorders. When you grow up with them you don't realize it. Move aside and you're able to get away from them for a while and you can you come back that's when you notice it. Grandmother I didn't realize she had a problem until after she passed. You don't recognize it because you don't know but it, it's um it's destructive. It's heart-wrenching. I watch a lot of people suffer from it. I was born and raised in China, which is a society that's like super hard on girls' weight. There's just like, like a popular saying that you're not a good girl if you weigh over 100 pounds. So if you reach the third digit, you're just fat. And uh, that's like what people around me been telling me this entire time. And I grew up being like a kind of chubby girl. I never was considered a skinny or anything. And then people will constantly give me nicknames like pig, fat, like all kind of stuff like that. And even my parents wouldn't stop telling me to lose some weight, eat less. For like a short period of time, my parents wouldn't even allow me on the dinner table because they want me to lose weight faster. So under that pressure, and since I was also like getting older, like that's when I started feeling self-conscious and I really wanted to lose weight. After a couple attempts at dieting and exercising, I ended up gaining all the weight back. That's when I started going extreme on myself. I started starving myself. That just caused me to have like growing appetite at everything, all the junk food and all, because my body is suffering from the lack of nutrition. And then I ended up binge eating. Then I went to bulimia because I felt guilty after binge eating. That's pretty much where my eating disorder all came from. I just say that I do feel like the reason why it's so hard to recover from the eating disorder is that I did lose over 50 pounds. People are treating me a lot better than they used to when, when I weighed more. I don't want to admit it's true because I believe people call me all different shapes and sizes and people who all love the way they are, but it's just so hard for myself to believe that. My journey was like really hard every morning waking up and just saying, I just want to be normal. And that's exactly it. I was like, I want to be normal, not realizing that I really was normal. I just needed yeah. to shed all this worry yeah. about my anxiety. 
pretty exhausting. I always felt that I had to put up a facade that everything was fine. Suffocation? It's like if you had an imaginary friend, they're just telling stuff to you 24-7 and all of it's negative. I think it's a struggle. I think it's not unique and it's manageable. Is it complicated? Adult emotions and experiences to blend together into sort of a nothingness. Terrible. Alone. Static. A roller coaster all-consuming or overwhelming really not like understanding your own brain in a way it's like a black hole like it just you just go down there and then it's so hard to come out scary and like limiting bewildering it comes differently for every single human that goes through it restrictive silenced life-altering it's like a hat sometimes it's heavy sometimes it's so light you can barely feel it scary is a very scary thing to deal with it's usually one choice that you make you tell yourself i'm only gonna do this once i'm so good at making myself throw up at this point that it's hard to go back so it's something that's so addictive addictive is also like a really good word to describe it i mean it can be debilitating at times and especially when you don't know what it is just scary so i would say debilitating and scary it's something that a lot of people in my family have struggled with so they definitely were very sympathetic it was hard for all of us but i'm glad i did it probably when i was first diagnosed i didn't even really think about being alone in my depression because i knew other people have had it when i first talked to my therapist and she like gave me insight on like other patients that she'd had mm -hmm. just in general i did research on the internet too and saw that a lot of other people like share their experiences like either on the specific meds that i was on different disorders i had seventh grade when one of my best friends said that she was also suffering from depression and anxiety. It just made me feel like I had someone who was battling the same battle. Me and my friends, all of us, we went through really hard times in seventh grade, not even noticing that we were going through them at the same time. We were all talking about like how we were in these places and then we're like, wait, I was too. And it was sort of like putting the pieces together. Although I can't 100% understand some of the things my friends are going through, it made me feel like I was a little bit more validated and that I had a support system. To me, I always knew that there were other people that had anxiety and who were feeling the same feelings. It's a common thing to be anxious, but but I think that the people who don't understand and don't actively look to understand, those people make it difficult. They make me feel like I'm more alone than, than the actual thought that there aren't other people like me does. Second time I was in the hospital, I was there for a while. My like, grandparents came to visit. Give me like a photo book of a bunch of photos of like me and my family and like my friends. Just having that photo book and like knowing like, they always cared. I know that they're always there for me. It's just one of those things that it feels like nobody else has it, but everyone else is probably feeling something similar to some degree. I think just talking to people, hearing movies and from school or talking to other people, like your project, it helps people realize and myself realize that it is a thing that many people feel. I feel like I've never been alone, which is why it was so weird feeling alone. I've always had close friends that I felt supported me in every way, and I always have my parents, and I always have my three older brothers. I've always just been such a sensitive, sensitive person, and you know, giving all of my love and energy into every situation. There were some times where I felt alone that I do vividly remember in elementary school feeling like these girls don't like me, these boys think I'm weird. I wasn't like living life, basically, is what it felt. You're never really alone because because even if you know you don't have a friend or a family member, there's always people struggling. None of us are ever alone. The mental health community can come together. I kinda knew I wasn't alone once like my friends opened up to me about their experiences. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say I never felt alone because I always had a really good therapist to go through it with. I actually went to the school psychiatrist. I just felt like I needed to tell someone that this is what I'm going through and I felt like people around me wouldn't understand because like I don't hear any lectures about eating disorder at school. Yeah. I didn't even know it was eating disorder until I looked that up on the internet. The first thing that she told me, you're not alone in this. A lot of students are suffering through the same thing. They just don't tell you. And once I actually started being more open about my eating disorder and started telling my friends, I started finding out that there are a lot of people around me who are also all, all different kind of disorders and mental illnesses. It's like, I'm definitely not alone in this. And a lot of people are going through the same thing. Nobody. It just needs to be talked about. From a school standpoint, it needs to make its way into the classroom so that there can be a more open conversation. I would be willing to talk to people about my experience if I knew that they were willing to have that conversation. I think if we just treat it like we would treat any other illness, more people would understand it and they would start to accept it. Even if you have that friend that always bails on you, even though they say no, still invite them. They say no because they can't get out of bed.
still invite them, still let them say no because when they stop getting that invite, everything just gets worse. I think that the more people who are open about the fact that they struggle, the more people talk about it, the better. But I also think that there needs to be more awareness on like a larger scale. People who have that really, really large power are gonna be the people who, if they speak out, and percentage-wise, some of them have depression, some of them have anxiety. And so having those people talk about their struggle and talk about, yeah, they have an issue, but they're working through it, or they're not working through it, and they're not really sure what to do. Like that vulnerability is so important, mm -hmm. and it's not easy. The stigma is difficult to get rid of because the people who have it don't want it. I think we need to have more conversations about it. Being silent about topics such as mental health allows it to be negative, but the thing is like, it's not a negative topic like everyone goes through and people deal with it, and we just need to be more open to it because those who are dealing with it, I feel like they should be comfortable and we should be comfortable to just help one another. More advocacy or just saying, you know, it's all right to be depressed, which I see a lot of. And the new generations, I think, are going to be a lot more accustomed to the idea of depression. Over time, I think society, everyone's just going to sort of get used to it. Change would come from a whole shift in our society to be more accepting, accepting that people come in different shapes and that you don't control that. As a society, we could work to change that, but I don't know how much hope I have that that's can happen. Honestly, just sharing out all of our stories, being honest with yourself, getting it out there that everyone has their own struggles. It doesn't even have to be like a specific illness, but if we just all come together and create like an accepting environment for like all these different problems that we all struggle with, that could really help. If you're comfortable sharing about your story, why not do it because it can help so many different people. Share your story and get it out there that we all deal with something. Don't make it such a big deal. Talking about it, be open-minded to everyone experience if we're just open-minded and if we don't shy away from the conversation it can make those who are a part of that community feel more accepted just getting people to recognize that it's not a choice we treat physical illness a certain way and mental illness a completely different way even though largely they are in the same vein in terms of how much control you have more people understanding what it really is it needs to be normalized in some way I think we talk about it more we talk a lot about race gender sexual orientation which I think is very important too I think mental health should be talked about just just as much as that. So many people suffer from things whether they know it or not. And sometimes I kind of get angry on how Moses Brown tries to act like they are doing something about it. It ends up feeling like they're doing something that they have to do, especially if you're talking about suicide. Sometimes it's hard to see if you're feeling like you don't really want to live, how much it's going to affect everyone around you, which obviously I, I think it's so wrong to say that suicide is selfish, but it definitely impacts everyone that you know more than you probably would realize. Just creating a safer, maybe smaller environment at first. Having honest conversations about it with our parents, with our friends, with our teachers. We should be able to have honest conversations about the stigmas around mental illness, what mental illness means for different people, and the different ways to cope with mental illness, because I think a lot of people don't know how, don't know what they're doing. Also, ideas of what mental illness is, because I think a lot of people can self-diagnose or or even not know. For those who believe in the stigma, believe that mental illness is fake, which some people do. If you think positive, everything will be positive. You know, that's just not always the case. It really isn't. For those people, you can have the right to your own opinion and don't make it harder for those who are struggling with mental illness. To end the stigma, we have to talk about the stigma. Awareness for our mental illness. Recognizing that suffering from mental illness is something that's common and that a lot of people face and it appears in different ways it's normal and it's okay to feel this way and it's not your fault. I just think talking about it, like the word like, oh, I feel so depressed right now is like really thrown around. Mm -hmm. But I think saying depression then becomes really taboo. I think we kind of ignore the weight of those words. Everybody's problems are valid. Just because you think someone's problems are worse than yours doesn't mean that yours are any less valid. Just make people more aware of it and stop like movies romanticizing it because that's not what someone looks like when they're like having those issues. They don't look like <laughs> a supermodel. Knowing people who have mental illnesses is a great way to understand it better. It can form in a multitude of ways. Exposure to that and honest and realistic depiction of it in media. Educate people. Mental illness, it's a real thing and nobody knows what goes on behind closed doors. Try to understand what is mental illness because I think everyone can have it. 
maybe at some time in their lives. Like speak about it as if it's an okay thing to talk about. Sharing your stories out loud. You know, people talk about microaggressions, times when you say something to someone and you don't realize the impact. Like people will say, oh my God, I'm gonna kill myself if I don't get an A on this. Like, and that's like a phrase we use all the time. And I find myself saying, actually, you know, when you say that, that actually has a very different meaning for some people. It's not like trying to make people feel guilty, but make people just sort of own their role and how they're impacting the culture around it. Education primarily, building a safe environment for someone to talk about their stuff. That's one of the blessings of this place. I think definitely stop putting labels on people. You know, you don't have to treat me like I'm a patient all the time. I'm really grateful that people around me are trying to help me and try to help me overcome this kind of, you know, scary disorders and whatever. Stop treating them so pitifully to the point that they feel like they are this like special group of people. That's also the reason why I didn't want to tell people around me. I don't want them to see me differently just because we have mental disorder. It doesn't mean that we're all psychopaths. <laughs> it's nothing bad. I think that's also like the stigma a lot of parents put around it. Just like it's shameful for them to admit. When I first confronted my parents that, hey, I've been making myself sick and this whole thing that I need a therapist, like, and they tell me to hide it. So they don't want other people to know that I'm going through this because it's just like something so negative. And like schools, should probably try to educate the kids more. Why don't they just talk about eating disorder a bit more? Like nobody's talking about eating disorders. We're so ignorant when it comes to eating disorders and I think schools should definitely do better on educating their children so that, like I said, a lot of people are going through this. I'm not alone. And if they never get educated from the school about disorders that they're going through, they're gonna be even more scared and confused. Be more educated. The school should put more attention on educating their kids on all sorts of mental disorders. To make you it affects every single piece of your life and every single piece of your life affects it. It's become normalized, I think. We become numb to what mental health looks like. I just think that like we need to be more educated on like what actually goes down instead of like just the same old story. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with that story, but like, what else are we doing besides just sharing the story? Like, how are we helping that person? A lot of people think they know what someone's going through. Even if you're depressed, you don't, you only know what people want you to know. You don't know everything. Ask questions. Even the, hey, how are you, could impact someone who's struggling with mental illness in so many ways. For me, it's been really important to have people to talk to, even though you might feel like isolating yourself might help you, but having people to turn to and having people who listen to me and finding my group of friends, that's what gets me through. I think utilize your relationships um, with people you trust and people who will be supportive. The whole topic really worries me at this level, on the high school level. Yeah. I think it's I think it's a huge problem. I think it's a growing epidemic, so I think I'm really glad you're doing this, and I just I, I, I would love to see more ways or support or be a part of more ways that we can make it be as owned and respected a part of someone's identity as your religion and your race and your gender and all those other mm -hmm. things. I mean, I think what you're doing is really Thank good you. and like really powerful. So us as a community can get better about the conversation because with like this project right now, this is at least something like I've never talked about mental health ever. At my yeah. five years at Moses Brown. Even in middle and lower school, it should still be a topic of conversation. It shouldn't just be for high schoolers, and it shouldn't just be seniors that are talking about it. It should be yeah. teachers that are implementing the conversation. I feel like it's a very common thing that high school students, middle school students, and like even lower schoolers go through. Yeah. Our community shies away from talking about conversations that are difficult so that we keep our image. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, that just makes students feel isolated. I don't know how they would do this, but if like in certain in classes you just have to talk about it like because everyone needs to feel like they belong if they're here in this community if you're going through any sort of mental illness just remember that you're not alone in this. Having a therapist is nothing shameful. And it is okay to share with your friends who would understand that you're going through something really hard. Just please don't feel ashamed of having a mental disorder. It's okay. You're just a stage of your life and I hope you all can overcome it. For anyone watching this, um, whoever you are, I love you. You're absolutely amazing. I may not even know you. And doesn't matter what anyone else thinks of you ever. Just matters what you think of you. And you better think highly of yourself because I'm sure a lot of people do. Good luck with everything. If anyone wants to reach out and have a conversation, you know, to follow up on any of my words, reach out. I'm here and Phil Moses Brown. <laughs> yes! We would take the world to his feet. Move. I won't dance. Bring
do is feed Move 